Hello, and welcome to Cognitum, a show dedicated to exploring the present and future of science and technology. I'm your host, Iosef Gerstein. Hello. Tonight our guest is Philip Maiman, Professor of Analytics at Fairfield University, Managing Editor of Algorithmic Finance, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Sports Analytics, Founding Editor of the Journal of Sports Betting, and Co-Founder and Instructor at Analytics.bet, an online school of applied math for sports betting. He is a veteran in the finance industry, having worked for LTCM, his own fund, and now a major global asset manager. Uh, very interesting things you talked about. Um, in the last episode, especially about the different approaches to finance, the mathematical behavior algorithmic, and you mentioned a little bit about P versus NP. Could you tell me more about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's one of the most amazing questions on Earth, does P equal NP, right? If you could quickly check the answer to a solution, does that mean you can quickly generate the answer to a solution? That the, the, the example we talked about last time, and I think it's a great example, is factoring. Right, this is the basis of all cryptography. If I give you a really, really, really large number, if I give you the number 15, yes, you can factor it. If I give you a very large number, you'll try two, <laughs> you'll, you'll, see, you'll try zero, maybe 10, um, but otherwise it's really hard to tell if it's the product of two very, very large numbers or, or not, or what those numbers would be. Um, but if I tell you those numbers, you can quickly multiply them to see if they match that given number, right? Mm -hmm. it, it might be yes, it might be no, but checking it is fast. Finding it, you have to look basically through every number, every prime number up to the square root. Basically, you have to, There's a lot of searching. So you could think of NP problems, non-deterministic polynomial, these sorts of guess and check sort of things as looking for a needle in a haystack. Right? It's a search problem. Can you search the space of all possible solutions and find the one that might work? And it's possible that none work. So you really, in a sense, have to check them all. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest question in computer science. Most computer scientists think it's not, th they're not the same, the P is not NP. Obviously one way is easy, right? Everything that is P is obviously in NP, right? If you can generate a solution quickly, then of course you can check to see if a solution is correct because you just generate the solution and see what it is, right? Um, it's going the other way. Is it that if you can guess it quickly, can you guess things quickly, right? Is, is that the same as checking it quickly? Um, and it turns out it's related to market efficiency, as, as we discussed. So maybe I can sketch through a bit of that proof and how it works. Absolutely. So think the, the NP problems would be like search, right? What's a good search thing in finance? Find a trading strategy, right? Let's suppose we list all possible trading strategies in increasing complexity or whatever. Um, how long would it take you to search them all? They're not an infinite amount, right? But it would take a potentially large time, and as you increase the, let's say, the number of days you're looking back, or the number of returns, or the factors you're using, it becomes harder and harder and harder. So, uh, if you can quickly find, if I give you a sample trading strategy, then by everything we talked about, just pure conventional finance, you can just run it and see how it worked. And you can do all sorts of tests on it. Is it, uh, you could try out of sample, you could try different markets, right? You can split it to see, is, are the profits only coming from one day, right? There's all sorts of tests you could do to see if this is a good strategy. So that's, that's NP, right? If I give you a trading strategy, you can check to see if it's good. Does that mean you can generate a good trading strategy? If you, if, if P equals NP, then yes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If P equals NP, then the ability to check for a good strategy means you can generate a new trading strategy. And if you, everybody on Earth can now generate very quickly all of the possible profitable trading strategies and implement them, then the markets will become efficient. There's no more way to make money from this kind of trading strategy. Reasonable? Yes. Now let's go the other way. The other way is more fun, which, which it's kind of mind-blowing. The statement is that if markets are efficient, then P equals NP. What? Right? Something about prices in the stocks can tell me some mathematical, deep, fundamental mathematical truth? Absurd! Here's how it works. Uh, if markets are efficient, because what does it mean for P to equal NP? There's two ways you could show that P equals NP. 
You could show some kind of proof and you can convince people that I think it's true. Or better yet, you would have some algorithm. Give me any hard searching problem in NP and I'll very quickly give you the answer, right? If I have this kind of black box, even if I don't tell you how it works, you can test it to see if it's doing what it's supposed to do, right? Are you quickly solving problems? Are you able to factor integers quickly, right? And other things. Um, so this, this black box will be the market. Uh, if the market is always perfectly efficient, this, this is the stringent, strong argument that conventional finance makes and rational finance markets are efficient, then um, I can show, it's, it's, uh, I'll hand wave a little bit, but the technical stuff is there. The basic idea is you would put in orders into the market in such a way, there is, there is a concept of order cancels order in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a pretty rarely used order, but it would mean like buy 10 shares of Apple or buy 12 shares of IBM, order cancels order. So if one is filled, the other is automatically canceled. You can never do both. Make mm -hmm. sense? Imagine there is a slight extension of that called order cancels order cancels order. So you could put three, not just two. Once you can put in three, then any, any NP question can be expressed in this way where you put in a bunch of order, cancel, order, cancel, orders, a sequence of them, and you wait a little bit of time, right? And if the market is able to complete them all, right, that means that there is a solution to what you were looking for. In other words, it solves that problem. In other words, we take this crazy mathematical question, factoring integers, we can convert it into some other form. We put that form into orders in the market. And if the market orders are filled in a specific way, that means there was a way to fill them all to maximize the profits of people. So this market efficiency turns out to be an incredibly strong statement, even stronger than you and I and other people have thought. Right? It's, it's absurd how strong market efficiency statement is because it implies P equals NP. Hmm. Do you think that's an indication of some sort of emergent phenomena of the market, of some collective consciousness as Whoa, indicated? Mind blowing. I don't think so. I, mm -hmm. I think it's more of an expression of how uh, rigidly strong and overstrong the hypothesis of market efficiency is. Mm -hmm. It's a useful hypothesis, right, to think that there's no way to make money. But it turns out that if it's absolutely, literally true, then it's, it's so strong that it starts uh, inf implying the truth of mathematical statements. But given that there's many alpha generators in the market, in yeah. fact, you could argue that most of the financial industry at least has a claim to generating alpha, that that would be at least a form of evidence that the, the market is not strongly efficient. I agree with you, the market's not efficient. Yes, I, I agree with that. So in other words, um, th there is this claim about market efficiency. And there's three possible approaches you can take to it. One, which 90% apparently of all finance professors do, which is just to blindly believe it. I think it's true. We're not in that camp. The second approach you can take is you can think, well, I see all these anomalies and phenomena in the market that make me personally believe that markets are not efficient. I think we, there is opportunity for making money. Fine. There's the third approach, which is just to say, I don't know if there's an opportunity for making money. I can't tell uh, because maybe it's all an illusion. I don't know. But I can tell theoretically that if the assumption are exactly what they say they are, that markets are efficient in all cases, in all worlds, and whatever, then that implies this unbelievable claim that nobody believes that P equals NP. It's just so absurd that uh, it, it makes me question the veracity of the underlying assumption regardless of what I see empirically in the market. Mm -hmm. So how does this relate to the three major fear theories that you discussed earlier? So this is the, uh, the, the, the central part of the algorithmic approach. So remember there were three approaches, right? There's the mathematical, the behavioral, and the algorithmic. I wonder, maybe it might make sense to look through, look for each of those. Let's, let's apply them to an application area just to highlight some of their mm -hmm. pros and cons or strengths and weaknesses. Let's start, with, um, let's start with risk factors. So what's a risk factor? Um, and where do they come from? Uh, the market is a risk factor, right? Because we all are exposed to it. We can't avoid it, right? So it's a, it's a systemic risk factor. You can avoid the idiosyncratic, the specific risks of certain stocks just by diversifying. But some risk you can't diversify away, that's a systemic risk, that's the market. Maybe there are other risk factors like small stocks or value or momentum or whatever else, right? 
Okay. Um, that's what a risk factor is. And that is basically con the conventional approach, is that risk factors come from the market. We can determine what they are through regressions. Fine. The behavioral approach to risk factors um, would say that uh, the, the risk factors are from psychology, right? They're not, they're not market risk factors so much as they represent the, the psychological and decision-making abilities of lots of human beings. The algorithmic approach is even more different. The algorithmic approach would say the risk factors may be uncomputable, right? Just like uh, certain things can't be, they're just too hard to compute. Um, it may not be useful to even talk about risk factors as being static. They change over time, right? Just like a computer program can change. Things, things change. That would be the algorithmic approach. Does that make sense for risk factors? Well, that risk is risky. Risk is risky. Yes. You know, you know what's even riskier is systemic risk. Let's talk about systemic risk then, okay? And like, the, you know, 2008 financial crisis, all sorts of... So what is systemic risk? Is that the risk of the system collapsing? Not just one particular stock or one particular market, but the whole system. Um, how does that... Uh, uh, what are the different perspectives on that from, from the three different paradigms? Well, the conventional approach to risk factors, to, excuse me, to systemic risk is kind of funny. It's that, because what can happen? If you regulate systemic risk, right? If you tell banks and others, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, you'd think, well, there's only three possible things that can happen. It can either work, <laughs> or it can backfire, or it can do nothing, right? There are only three possibilities. From the conventional approach, uh, any regulation should do nothing. <laughs> nothing. Why? Uh, I heard... Um, I forget who it, who it was. I think it was Stephen Ross gave a lecture once about derivatives. And he, he said this phrase that stuck with me ever since. He says, um, any finite tax code should generate zero revenue. Right? Because if it's fixed and not changing, this is the tax code, meaning don't do this, don't do that, here's a charge for this, then people eventually change their behavior to not do the things that cause taxes and do everything else, the, all of the ways that they can get deductions and not have to pay. You have to be a nonprofit, fine, everyone's a nonprofit, whatever it is, right? So then you have to keep changing the rules. That's why the tax rules keep changing. So if it's a fixed and finite series of regulations, it'll do nothing because people, it's just like throwing a rock into a river. The river will just move around, right? So that's the conventional approach. There's basically no amount of regulation can do anything. As long as the markets keep functioning, they'll just move around it. Fine. What's the behavioral approach to risk regulation? What, what is the behavioral viewpoint? Behavioralism assumes people can be manipulated. We have defaults. We have certain ways that we see the world. Things can be framed. We could be primed. There's all sorts of ways that the world can be manipulated and we could be manipulated into making different decisions. Now, there's ethical concerns there, right? Should you manipulate people? Or one way around it, as Thaler and, and Sussman in their book Nudge point out is, you could manipulate people in a way that, like for example, changing the defaults in a, in a cafeteria line is their primary example. Should you put the fries first or the cucumbers first, right? And that'll affect how people actually eat. Did you manipulate them? Yeah, you manipulated them, but if you ask them in a separate context, which would you have rather we did to you, they would agree this is better, right? Better to be healthier. And anyway, that, that's an ethical aside. In other words, the behavioral approach would suggest that regulating risk is, is first of all, possible, and secondly, desirable. So it, it should work. And if it didn't work, then we just need to tweak how we're doing the manipulation and the rules and regulations. The algorithmic approach is, uh, the algorithmic viewpoint on this would be completely different. It's that risk regulations will backfire. Mm -hmm. Not that they won't do anything. Not that they'll work. They'll do the exact opposite. How? How could they do the opposite? One way to think about it is imagine a tightrope walker. Okay, so you're on a tightrope, right? You're a professional tightrope walker. There's a certain amount of risk, right? Mm -hmm. You might fall off, you might not. And you're balancing carefully that risk and reward or entertainment value or whatever it is. Along comes happy Mr. Regulator. And happy Mr. Regulator says, uh-uh, we don't want people falling anymore, right? That's dangerous for the entire economy if tightrope walkers stop falling. So instead of, it used to be there was a net under you, or let's say a pool of water. So if you fall, you're hurt, but you're not dead. We're going to do one better. We're going to put alligators in the pool. This way, if you fall, you're really going to be torn to shreds. And that should make you be a safer tightrope walker, right? Uh, not necessarily. Why not? Well, I mean, you'll get nervous, you'll, you'll, you'll get fall nervous. off. You'll get nervous and you'll fall off, right? 
it backfired. They didn't become safer. They became more dangerous. They fell more frequently, right? That's exactly how backfiring can work when you're regulating systemic risk on banks. What happens is you're basically going to tell banks, look, these assets, this is the risk of these assets. This is the risk of those assets. Some of those perceived regulatory viewpointed risks will be wrong. And there will be a, a series of assets that are regulatorily favored, right, mm -hmm. that everybody will want to hold because the regulators say they're safe, even if they're not. Subprime mortgages, <laughs> right? We have, oh, we have five years of data. They were fine. So let's hold them, right? Um, and this, the algorithmic approach would say, no matter what you do with the regulations, you're sque it's like squeezing one of these uh, Martian dolls, you know, with the things that pop out. You squeeze somewhere else, an ear pops out or an eye, right? It's got to go somewhere. So it'll, it'll always backfire. Mm -hmm. It'll always backfire. Um, well, my, my dad and I wrote a paper about this showing that systemic risk will, will always backfire. Um, and it uh, is very controversial. Right? Nobody likes that conclusion. Behaviorals don't like that conclusion. Conventional don't like Regulators don't like that conclusion. But it's a true conclusion. The one thing it misses, which we can't say, is when it's going to happen. We know that the risk is hidden, and it will rear its ugly head at some point and destroy the world. But we don't know when. But we know that it will happen. So the financial crisis was not something... So the conventional approach would say the financial crisis would have happened anyway. Right? The, uh, uh, the behavioral approach says, oh, we just needed be better people in power making the rules. The algorithmic approach would say it's inevitable and it was caused by the regulations and it will happen again. Mm -hmm. So according to the algorithmic approach, the only way forward is an unregulated financial market. There's, uh, technically, there's two ways forward. Mm -hmm. One is a completely unregulated financial market. The other is a totally nationalized and centralized financial market. Uh, with one czar, dictator, who says, you may buy this, you may not buy this, right? Because you have to violate the rule of law. You have to say to JP Morgan, you can buy it, but Citibank, you cannot, mm -hmm. right? Which violates, you know, there should be one rule for everybody. No, no, it has to be, in other words, if you nationalize all the banks, or, or if some might say if you complete nationalizing all the banks, then um, there's one person, they all become branches. And you can say, you've had enough. You, don't, you can do a little more, right? Which would violate everything. And it would require the czar to be perfectly omniscient, see the future, and also be so humble that he takes no salary uh, and, is, and is nice and benevolent and, you know, is a dictator. Uh, obviously ridiculous extreme. So, yes, the only ultimate solution would be to a complete deregulation of the markets, including getting rid of the Fed, getting rid of the FDIC, everything. Mm -hmm. How does this relate to currency? To currency? Um, like what kind of currency you have in mind? Fiat currency. Yes. So here's what the FDIC does. Um, it, and it can only do this in a fiat currency situation. A bank, how does a bank work? You, banks, it feels like banks are safe, right? Because they have safes and they have vaults, but they're empty. No one uses those vaults anymore. No one's banging, you know, shooting and robbing guns, uh, banks anymore. Uh, the fact is all banks do is they take money from depositors and lend it out. They're a lending institution, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, it's a great business because, you know, they say casinos are a great business because people walk in, they spend some time, they empty their wallets and their pockets and they leave. Great business, right? Banks are even better because you don't even walk into a bank. All that matters, think about where you had your bank. What, what the first, the primary bank you used, how did you choose it? I bet if you're like most people, one of the big considerations was location, convenience, right? Mm -hmm. All you need to be a bank and a successful bank is to have a great location. If you open a branch near a Starbucks, it doesn't even have to be a very big branch. All you need is a door that says bank, right, and the FDIC symbol. People just walk by, oh, just throw their wallets in. Here, have my money. They don't even, you don't even need the real estate or the games of a casino, nothing. They just throw their money and keep walking. And the bank then takes that money and lends it out and so on. So when people don't pay back, there's a risk, right? What they're doing is creating risk and then paying you a little bit of an interest to keep your, keep your interest. Um, that's what the FDIC allows. Uh, because without the FDIC thing that says you're, every depositor is insured, there might be a bank run. What's a bank run? If you've seen It's a Wonderful World. It's a Wonderful World or It's a Wonderful Life? Uh, it's 1960s. Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, what happened there? There's a bank run. If people think the bank will fail, 
they'll come in and say, give us our money back. And, oh, I don't have your money here. It's in Bill's house and Ted's house, and, right? Uh, because they've lent it out. If people were able to wait until they really needed the money, the bank would have survived. Oh, no, that's a problem. How do we solve it? We solve it with the FDIC. Because now if you know that your money is insured by the United States government, not just the United States, the full faith and credit of the United States government, then you can, oh, there's a bank run, I don't care. Uncle Sam will write me a check tomorrow for all of my money, right? I'm fully insured. So I don't do the bank run, the bank survives, great. And here's the bonus, the, the clincher is the uh, uh, FDIC doesn't actually have to spend any money. Right? Just by saying they would spend money, it avoids a bank run. A perfectly healthy, solvent bank remains healthy and solvent. Great. Uh, the problem is that this generates what kind of activity in the banks? They're protected. Right? Even if their depositors are evil, vicious, violent mobsters or something, they don't care because they know that they're going to get their money back. Right? No kneecaps are going to get broken. So go ahead and lend out to the riskiest things you can find. Mm-hmm. That's the natural inclination of now any bank that has this moral hazard problem of the FDIC. They want to find the riskiest possible investment that they can. And that's where the risk regulators come in. Oh, no, you can't do that. You can't do this, right? So it's the same situation. That, that's the essence of everything that will happen forward. We will always have these kinds of risk problems because of the FDIC and the currency and the fiat that you mentioned. So they have incentives to push into as much hidden risk as possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. With one additional problem, that's absolutely true, but they will all be doing the exact same thing. It's not like different banks are going to find different hidden assets. They're all going to find the exact same ones because those are the ones that are regulatorily favored. Subprimes or whatever the flavor du jour is, right? So that when that one little teeny tiny asset that nobody really cared about before starts going down, right? Eventually, everything goes down a little bit, right? Starts going down more than any model would have predicted and the regulatory model predicted. It's not just one bank that has to sell. They all have to sell the same thing. Now the price is zero. Now they have to start selling other assets. Now we have a systemic collapse. Yeah, it's a bank run on an asset. Yes, yes, which triggers an entire syst systemic run, mm -hmm. causing the very thing that it was trying to prevent. Completely reasonable. So tell me about the nature of risk and hidden risk. How do we, in all of these approaches, we use this concept risk, but you know, in, in, mathematic, in mathematical finance, often it's just variance. Yes. Um, in, but risk is more than just variance. So how, what are the competing measures of risk, and what is the approach to risk, and what are the underlying philosophies that animate these approaches? There's, um, first we should take a step back. So we talk about what finance came from, right? The word fin, right, and mm -hmm. settling in debt. Risk comes from uh, even ancient word, more ancient word, meaning unknown or something that you can find at sea, right? And risk used to have two meanings, good risk and bad risk. You could, you know, if you go exploring in the ocean, you might die, but you might find treasure, right? So risk used to mean uncharted waters. But nowadays, like if someone asks you in an interview, what is risk? You have to say the pat answer that everyone's expecting, that it's the uh, uh, probability and impact of loss. So it's only loss. What's likely that it can happen? What happens if you lose? But really, you're, you're right to point out that this is, this is the, at the heart of the issue. Risk almost can't be defined perfectly well. You can have working definitions, right? And that's what a lot of these risk measures are. They're sort of just working definitions of what is risk. But because time is involved, other people, how much, what is, what is risk? It almost can't be defined, but finance you might think of as the study of risk. Right? How do you split and slice and dice risk into ways that makes it more palatable and get higher prices? Is that a problem that risk can't be defined? Uh, not necessarily. Same as biology. Biology is the study of life. You're, you're an expert, right? But is there a, a completely 100% accurate definition of life? Um, no. It's but there's not. lots of great working definitions, right? It depends on the problem to be solved. You, you, you choose your definition based on your objective. Perfect. That's exactly what we do in finance with risk. Right? If you're doing something where you're do, you want to have an efficient frontier, like Markowitz's mean variance, then you, variance equals risk, exactly like you said. If you're doing a more real-world portfolio construction, maybe the, the risk is downside risk, or how much of the tail, or, or conditional variance, or all sorts of different measures, depending on, precisely as you put it, your objective, what you want to do. Now, the, the reason we bear risk is to try to make money. We don't want risk for its own sake, right? So that extra 
prophet is called Alpha. You've mentioned it. Um, and the three different paradigms also have different approaches to Alpha. So the conventional approach to Alpha would be that there is no Alpha, right? Because it's the same as the, the in income tax code. Everybody can trade. The markets are efficient. There can't possibly be any alpha. Anything that seems to you as if you're making returns is just an expression of risk. You're bearing some risk that the market is willing to pay you for, right? You're just holding the market. Uh, the behavioral approach would say that alpha is negative. When we trade, we tend to make the wrong decisions, not just the transactions costs, but we tend to buy at the highs and sell at the lows. And absent momentum and other factors, we tend to trade in ways that lose money. So alpha is possibly negative. The algorithmic approach, going back to the PNNP, right, finding a trading strategy suggests that alpha may quite well be positive because P doesn't equal NP, because there are all these strategies to check. There are returns to you of finding something. If you find a strategy that works that nobody else knows about, you might actually make money from it. So it's a reward mechanism for being first or being yes. smartest yes. or being fastest. Or, or more enduring in stamina, whatever it is, yes. If in the conventional view there is no alpha, and any time we observe alpha, that's just a measure of risk that wasn't captured, isn't it tautological? Isn't there no way to disprove the theory because it explains away any anomaly? Yes, that goes back to absolutely. Um, it's not. It, it's tautological with a twist. Uh, so market efficiency does have to have a model of market equilibrium. Eugene Fama has pointed this out for decades. Uh, you can't just say markets are efficient without saying what it means to be efficient, what the risk factors are that continue to exist. So relative to some model of market equilibrium, the markets are efficient. Um, if you find something that appears relative to the model that you've chosen to continue to exhibit persistent outperformance, then the next step is you say, aha, it's a new risk factor. And so you add it into your model. So let's say we've determined that momentum is a new risk factor. It, it's not explained by anything else. It continues to outperform. There's no regression problems. It's real. We can either say markets are not efficient relative to the previous model that we believed, or markets are efficient relative to this new model, this extended model, where momentum is now a risk factor. So uh, in a sense, yes, it's tautological. But we're, as we're adding it, that's a major step. Right? We're now acknowledging that this is something that people care about. Could this all just be very myopic? For example, that uh, momentum as a strategy which has worked for 50 years is just part of a regime, and the regime is fundamentally unstable. So as soon as the psychology changes or there is a new theory or something that infects a lot of investors' minds, that momentum will cease existing, and there will be maybe potentially negative momentum as a factor, and we won't even recognize it so long as we believe in that factor? Yes, that absolutely can happen. And, and that's why we talked about the fourth approach, the mindfulness approach, that that's the approach that I think is poised for enormous success, specifically for thinking about and answering that kind of question, as things change. Right? All the other approaches, they allow for a little bit of change within the parameters, like a variance or something. but substantial change, like new knowledge being generated by human beings in a creative sense, right? Something that we think maybe a computer can or can't do, you know, it's a different discussion. Um, but if they do that, how, how does that affect reality and, and, and prices of financial assets? And can we change people's behavior by making them, let's say, more mindful in a Langarian sense, so that they see different uh, perspectives, that they're more appreciative of uncertainty. Maybe uncertainty is a form of risk, right? We don't know what's going to happen. Um, I think th there's a lot to work out there, but I think it's, it's very promising. And are there you know, any takeaways on how to increase this mindfulness behavior in the individual investor? Absolutely. As Alan Langer says, uh, mindfulness is the simple process of actively noticing new things. Look around you, notice three things you've never in your life noticed before, and then ask yourself, why did I not notice them? Now you've unlocked your ability to notice multiple perspectives. You come to appreciate uncertainty. You wonder why you don't know the things you didn't know, and you become a more mindful person. And happiness follows. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you join us next time as we explore and elucidate the frontiers of science and technology with the thinkers creating the future.